It was 1987, a year that would forever change the course of history in the Middle East. As the sun set over the ancient lands of Israel and Palestine, whispers of change echoed through the narrow streets and bustling markets. A new organization was taking shape, one that would soon become a household name worldwide. Its name? Hamas. The backdrop was the First Intifada, a Palestinian uprising against Israeli rule. The air was thick with tension, and every stone thrown, every shout, was a testament to the deep-seated frustrations of the Palestinian people. Amidst this chaos, Sheikh Ahmed Yasser, a spiritual leader with vision and determination, saw an opportunity. He envisioned an organization that would not only resist Israeli occupation, but also champion the cause of Islam. Drawing inspiration from the Muslim Brotherhood, an influential Egyptian movement, Hamas was born with a dual purpose, political resistance and religious zeal. But Hamas wasn't just another faction in the complex tapestry of Middle Eastern politics. It was unique, driven by a constitution that outlined its beliefs and objectives. This constitution was more than just a document. It was a declaration of intent. It rejected any negotiated settlement with Israel and believed in reclaiming the entire land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea through Jihad, a holy struggle. The Constitution also delved into the historical and religious motivations behind the movement. It traced the struggle against the Zionist invaders back to ancient times, drawing parallels with the Crusades and the Great Arab Revolt. Such references were not mere rhetoric. They were designed to galvanize support and paint the conflict in broader historical and religious strokes. Furthermore, the Constitution propagated certain controversial ideas. It suggested that Jews had been behind significant world events like the French Revolution and the Communist Revolution. While such claims were debatable, they showcased the depth of mistrust and the extent of the ideological divide. As the days turned into months, Hamas began to make its presence felt. Its first targets were Palestinians deemed to be collaborating with Israeli authorities. However, it wasn't long before its operations expanded, targeting Israeli soldiers and employing tactics like kidnappings and suicide bombings. By the end of 1987, it was clear that Hamas was not just a fleeting phenomenon. It was here to stay, and its impact would be felt for. The late 1980s and early 1990s were tumultuous times in the Middle East. As the First Intifada raged on, Hamas's influence grew, not just in Palestine, but across the region. Their tactics evolved, becoming more sophisticated and at times more brutal. But why? What drove this evolution? In 1994, a turning point arrived. A Jewish extremist named Baruch Goldstein unleashed terror in Hebron, killing 29 Muslims during their sacred Ramadan prayers. The aftermath was bloody with 19 more Palestinians losing their lives in clashes with Israeli forces. This act of violence was a watershed moment for Hamas. They vowed revenge, signaling a shift in their tactics. No longer would they solely target military installations. Civilians were now in the crosshairs. Suicide bombings became a hallmark of Hamas's operations. Buses, cafes and markets, places teeming with innocent lives, became scenes of devastation. The world watched in horror, but for many in Palestine, these acts were seen as desperate measures in desperate times. The international community was divided, while countries like the United States and many EU members labeled Hamas a terrorist organization. Others, like Iran, saw them as freedom fighters, offering financial and military aid. This external support bolstered Hamas's capabilities, allowing them to launch more audacious attacks and solidify their position in Palestinian politics. But it wasn't just about violence. Hamas also ventured into the political arena, participating in elections and even forming a government in Gaza. Their political aspirations were clear, to be the voice of the Palestinian people, both in their struggle against Israel and in their quest for statehood. Yet, with power came challenges. Governing proved to be a complex task, especially with the constant threat of Israeli incursions and a blockade that stifled Gaza's economy. 
The dream of a united Palestinian front seemed elusive, with divisions between Hamas and other Palestinian factions like Fatah. As the years rolled on, Hamas found itself at a crossroads. The world had changed, and so had the dynamics of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. New players entered the scene, and old alliances were tested. The question remained, would Hamas adapt to these changing times, or would they remain entrenched in their old ways? The dawn of the new millennium brought with it a world that was rapidly changing. The age of information had begun, and with it, the narratives of conflicts were no longer solely in the hands of mainstream media. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict, with Hamas at its forefront, was now under the global microscope, analyzed and debated in real time on platforms like social media. Hamas, once a shadowy organization operating in the alleyways of Gaza, was now a recognized political entity, governing a significant portion of Palestinian territories. But with governance came responsibilities, and the dichotomy of being both a resistance movement and a governing body presented challenges. In Gaza, the daily struggles of the people were evident. Infrastructure was crumbling, unemployment rates were soaring, and the blockade imposed by Israel made basic necessities a luxury. Hamas, as the governing body, was expected to provide solutions. But how could they, when their very identity was rooted in resistance against what they perceived as an occupying force? Internationally, the perception of Hamas was mixed. While they had sympathizers who viewed them as the embodiment of Palestinian resistance, there were equally vocal critics who denounced their tactics, especially the use of suicide bombings and rocket attacks. The label of terrorist organization was hard to shake off, and it impacted Hamas's efforts to gain legitimacy on the global stage. Yet, amidst these challenges, there were moments of introspection. The Hamas leadership, realizing the changing dynamics of global politics, began to show signs of moderation. There were talks of recognizing Israel's right to exist and accepting a two-state solution. These were monumental shifts in their stance, indicating a possible move towards diplomacy over armed struggle. But old habits die hard. The armed wing of Hamas, the Izza Din Al-Qassam Brigades, continued its operations against Israel. Rocket attacks, tunnel infiltrations and skirmishes with the Israeli Defense Forces were frequent. This dual approach of seeking diplomatic solutions while simultaneously engaging in armed conflict confused many, both within Palestine and outside. The Palestinian populace was torn. While many supported Hamas's resistance against Israel, they also yearned for a better quality of life, something that seemed unattainable with the ongoing conflict. The youth, especially, began to voice their frustrations, not just against Israel, but also against their leaders, including Hamas. As the years went by, it became evident that for Hamas to remain relevant, they had to evolve. The question was, in which direction? Would they prioritize governance and the well-being of their people, or would the ethos of resistance continue to dominate their agenda? As the second decade of the 21st century neared its end, the Palestinian territory stood at a pivotal juncture. The dream of a united Palestine, free from occupation and conflict, seemed distant, but not unattainable. At the heart of this dream was Hamas, a force that had shaped the region's politics for over three decades. The challenges were manifold. Internally, the rift between Hamas and Fatah, the two dominant Palestinian factions, had deepened. Both parties had their strongholds, Hamas in Gaza and Fatah in the West Bank. But for the average Palestinian, these divisions were a source of despair. They longed for unity, for a leadership that would prioritize their aspirations over political infighting. Hamas, sensing the mood of the people, began to make overtures towards reconciliation. Talks were initiated and agreements were signed. But the path to unity was fraught with setbacks. Old grievances resurfaced and mutual distrust lingered. Yet, the desire for a united front against Israel kept the dialogue alive. Externally, the geopolitics of the Middle East was in flux. Traditional allies of Palestine, like Syria and Iraq, were embroiled in their own conflicts. 
New players like Iran emerged as backers of Hamas, providing them with financial and military aid. But this support came with its own set of challenges. Balancing these external relationships while maintaining a distinct Palestinian identity was a tightrope walk for Hamas. The world was watching and international pressure was mounting. The call for a two-state solution grew louder, with many nations advocating for the coexistence of Israel and Palestine as independent, sovereign states. Hamas, once vehemently opposed to this idea, began to show signs of flexibility. But would this be enough to break the impasse? The road ahead was uncertain. But one thing was clear. The status quo was untenable. For Hamas, the choices were stark. They could either adapt to the changing realities and prioritize the well-being of their people, or remain entrenched in their old ways, risking further isolation and suffering. As the sun set over the ancient lands of Israel and Palestine, the hope for a brighter future remained. A future where children could grow up without the fear of conflict, where families could thrive, and where the dream of a united, prosperous Palestine could finally be realized.